you. My first job out of college was with the National Security Agency. I was a crypt analyst, a code breaker with the NSA. They started us out with really simple hand encryption systems, glorified Caesar ciphers and jumbles. Then they moved you to more complex manual systems, keyed polyalphabetic ciphers. The NSA actually declassified the book, the Bible that we were trained on, military cryptanalytics. After you proved you were worth hiring, NSA moved the young code breakers to machine systems. In World War II, these were rotor-based systems, and in the 1980s, they were computer-based, binary. Again, they started you off with easy systems, and hopefully you succeeded. Every time you cracked the code, they rewarded you with a harder problem. After about three years, if you were talented, you were working on systems that no one knew if they'd ever be cracked. The talented and lucky cryptanalyst might break a system every two, five, or eight years. And others could go decades without progress or results. And this is when I first noticed it, the importance of belief. Why did some cryptanalysts get lucky over and over again? Sure, they were brilliant, but so were many of the others who rarely or never made any progress on cracking the code. The answer was easy if you looked. They came in almost every day believing they would succeed in cracking the code. The unlucky ones came in, did some work, usually the same thing they did last month and last year, and were really, whether they knew it or not, just marking time until the day was done, until their career was done. I don't have a statistic on it, but I'm certain that those unlucky cryptanalysts missed many opportunities to crack the code because they didn't believe they would ever succeed. Do you believe you can prevent cyber attacks on OT from causing a high consequence event? If you can't answer yes to that question, you have to be living with a lot of stress, and I'm, I'm glad you're here to recharge and recover. Belief is powerful, even false belief. Scientists have proven this over and over again with placebo effect experiments. My favorite example is acupuncture. Ten German health insurance companies put almost a half a million patients with, with lower back pain through a series of acupuncture treatments. Three out of the four patients said the acupuncture worked. They had a marked or moderate reduction in pain. This is better than standard medical treatment with drugs, prosthetics, physical therapy, and it costs less. So great, acupuncture is a solution, not so fast. Another study, future studies, included a group that thought they were getting acupuncture, but no needles were used just a toothpick, pressing lightly on the skin to make them think they were getting acupuncture. The results were almost identical, and still much better than standard medical care. The belief that acupuncture would reduce that back pain, also neck pain, migraine, headache, and other pain was so strong that the pain subsided. Even after those studies showed that there was little difference between sham and actual acupuncture, the German health insurance companies that funded the study decided to pay for acupuncture treatments. They got the results they wanted. Patients got better at a lower cost. Let's look at our OT security beliefs, the things we hear, the things we say. It makes it hard for us to believe we're going to succeed. One of the most common beliefs is that we have to be perfect. The attacker just has to succeed one time while the defender has to stop all attacks. Who can really believe they'll be perfect? I see many OT security professionals, some of you in this audience, give conference presentations, webinars, white papers on a growing number of ominous sounding adversaries and attacks. Bull Typhoon, Chernovite, Sandworm in Controller, what chance do we have to stop these almost godlike villains from succeeding one time? 
Perfect shouldn't be our measure. There's too many people making mistakes, too many latent vulnerabilities in our products, too many players in our supply chain. I can't believe that I can stop every attack against a computer, switch, PLC, sensor, actuator from ever succeeding. We need different metrics. We need metrics and stories that highlight success and feed the belief that we can succeed. Not a false success, but when we succeed, and we often do, we shouldn't just brush it aside until we wait till the next time we can hype up failure. I often have engineers come up to me and say, security needs to learn from safety. Where are, where are the signs posted and daily updated that say 423 days since the last cyber incident caused an injury or outage? One place where safety or where security can learn from safety is how they measure success, the impact of their safety program. A lot of companies track a total recordable incident rate. It is the number of injuries and other safety incidents that they have to report multiplied by 200,000 divided by the total number of hours worked. In industrial sectors, a rate below three is considered good. Hmm. Good isn't zero, it's below three. We're seeing increasing requirements for reporting cybersecurity incidents to governments and industry. We could have a similar rate where we said the total reportable OT cyber incidents, the ones we have to report, multiplied by number, divided by some unit of production. The U.S. Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC, the U.S. Department that regulates public companies, in December, the SEC issued a requirement that public companies report cyber incidents that would have a material impact on the company, an impact that could affect stock price. We're three months into this reporting requirement right now, and there haven't been any reported incidents that have affected OT and operations. It seems that many U.S. public companies are succeeding with OT cyber risk. The things we highlight, um, even I might even say celebrate, these OT cyber incidents, uh, they become the top news story. They get put in every press release, every webinar, every presentation. I still see, in 2024, I still see mentions of the Iranian attack on the Bowman Avenue Dam. Back in 2013, a tiny, rarely used sluice gate. There are even presentations, I didn't see any in S4 presentations, but there are even presentations that highlight the Marucci Shire event from 2018. We love our OT security events or incidents, whether they had an impact or not. In November of last year, we had the now infamous Iranian-affiliated hacker group, the Cyber Avengers, attack Aliquippa Water in Pennsylvania, a small municipal water utility with 6,615 customers. They did manage to take out some OT cyber assets, but not water delivery. Those 6,000 households were not without clean, safe, drinkable water, not even for a minute. In contrast, last August, an upcountry Maui wildfire where I live, not the horrific one in Lahaina, but one of the three other wildfires on the island that terrible day, the upcountry Maui wildfire melted some of the water infrastructure, potentially releasing benzene and other dangerous chemicals into the water supply. About 7,000 residents in Kula, including my family, were without safe water for over three weeks. In case you think this was a once in a hundred year event, about two years earlier, a large rainstorm took out some of the above ground water infrastructure and we had no water for four days, uh, no drinkable water for over 60 days. 
There are thousands of these small scale outages in water every year, thousands. The cyber attack on Aliquippa, the disputed attack on Oldsmar, and as far as I know, every other attack on the US water sector in recent years has had zero customer impact. One way that you can start to believe that you can succeed in OT cyber risk management is to look at the outages due to cyber incidents as a percentage of all cause outages. Create the pie chart. How big is that cyber incident slice? In the water sector in the US, it would just be crumbs. The same is true in the US electric sector where we have even better data. The, the US Energy Information Agency puts out a metric called SADI. It's System Average Eruption Duration Interruption Index. Uh, simply stated, it is the amount of time the average customer is without power for a year. We don't have the 2023 data out yet, but in 2022, the average customer in the US was without power for 333 minutes. 200 of those minutes were due to major weather events. Zero or near zero of those incidents were due to cyber incidents. Again, crumbs. So while we shouldn't perpetuate and promote beliefs that are negative and untrue, we also shouldn't hide from the truth. A same manufacturing or outage pie chart manufacturing would not look so good. Ransomware has caused a number of incidents in manufacturing. In 2023, a Clorox manufacturing outage pie chart might look like this. This is not a real pie chart. But Clorox lost 26% of their manufacturing capacity in the third quarter of last year due to a cyber attack. And they were one of many companies that faced that. Another sector that didn't do so well in 2023 was hospitals. Cyber incident outages would be at least a small slice of the hospital service time outage pie. Are any of you having trouble with this total total recordable incident rate or SEC material incident rate or these outage pies? Because as I was writing this, I did. It's really important that we track and show results. But they're lagging indicators. The bad event has already happened. It's not enough. The safety industry realized this after the BP Texas City explosion that killed 15 injured 180, and caused about uh, 300 million in damages. The Baker panel report on that Texas City tragedy stated, the passing of time without a process accident is not necessarily an indication that all is well and may contribute to a dangerous and growing sense of complacency. After this report, the safety industry decided to develop leading indicators predictive of process safety accidents. And a good example of this is API recommended practice 754 for the pipeline and refinery sectors, or I'm sorry, refinery and petrochemical sectors. Recommended practice 754 has four tiers of indicators. Tier one is the bad event has happened. A loss of process material containment, and someone was injured or killed. It's a lagging indicator. Tiers two through four are leading indicators. Again, predictive of process safety accidents. Tier two is a loss of process material containment with no personnel safety consequence. So if a, if a gas detector goes off but no one's injured, it's a tier two event. Tier three is when a safeguard is challenged. If a gas relief valve lifts, that would be a tier three event. And tier four is when an inspection or process doesn't happen as it should. It's not difficult 
to imagine how we could have an OT version of this. We don't have a recommended practice yet, but we could. Tier one is a high consequence event. It could be a major outage, uh, loss of life, costly equipment damage. Again, the bad event has already happened. Tier two would be when an attacker has access that could have caused a tier one event, but didn't. Tier three, when a cyber asset was compromised, but that compromise couldn't have caused a tier one event. I believe that Aliquippa, Oldsmar, if you believe it was a hack, and a lot of our OT cyber incidents that get so much hype would be tier three events. And tier four would be when your cyber maintenance or your cyber hygiene isn't happening as, pop, as it should be. This recommended practice 754 is really worth a look because it introduces a couple things like severity weightings of tier one events. And it's not difficult to imagine you could create a weighted metric of tier two through four events into a single score. But here's the key thing, the cause for celebration. I know many asset owners who go years without a single tier one, tier two, or tier three event at a site. This is success. In the OT security community, we've been fighting realities and beliefs. The reality in many cases, it's never happened before. Many organizations, many companies have never suffered a major outage or other impact to OT and operations due to a cyber incident. And for years, over a decade, there's been a belief that this immunity to the OT security threat would continue. With this belief, it's very understandable that many OT security professionals trafficked in FUD. If you're a product or service vendor trying to sell to a potential customer, they need to believe there's a threat. And if you work for an asset owner and you're trying to create an, an OT security budget or grow it, media hyping up the latest OT cyber incident helps. You know, you can say, here's why we need this product. Here's why we need to hire these people. We're past that. The FUD worked. Accenture, in 2023, in their Cyber Resilient CEO survey, found that 74% of 1,000 CEOs surveyed were concerned about their company's ability to avert or minimize a cyber attack's impact on their business. Now, concern is kind of easy to say yes to if you're an executive, yes, I'm concerned. Uh, Deloitte asked it with the results emphasis. What external factors did you, affect, did you expect to influence or disrupt your business strategy next year? 25% said cyber attack or cyber risk. Now this is higher than weather, environment, supply chain, and a lot of other things, and up over 8% over 2022. We are at a point where the perceived OT cyber risk actually exceeds the data determined real risk. Like a poorly tuned control loop, we've overshot our desired set point. It's time to dampen the FUD and use that real data to define, measure, and address OT cyber risk. Can we be mature and professional enough to pull back from the FUD and to recognize when we're succeeding and live with the fact that sometimes we will fail and that's okay? Now there are some unacceptable consequences and that's where your unhackable safety and protection systems come in. But outside of those, OT cyber incidents are gonna fall across the range of consequence categories just like all other risks. I do believe we can pull back from the fight, at least make it less effective, minimize its impact. You, the S4 attendees here, are the early adopters. You're the influencers in the OT security space. You also, whether you know it or not, have a lot of 
influence on adjacent fields like tech media, insurance, regulation, investors. I ask of you two things beginning here at S4. One, define what success means for you in OT security, risk management. I contend success is not deploying and maintaining a long list of security controls. Success is minimizing the impact of cyber incidents on OT and operations. Not eliminating, minimizing. Remember those pie charts. And two, don't be afraid to talk about success. 2023 was a highly successful year in OT cybersecurity for power, water, refinery, pipeline, and many other sectors. How often, how often have you heard that? Have you ever said that? It was less successful in manufacturing, hospitals, and a few other sectors. Collect and show your data for your company and your industry, and then take the appropriate results to address risk to meet your definition of success. And most importantly, believe you can succeed. Thank you and enjoy S4.